And there we go. Okay, everybody. Uh, my name is David Chinnery. I'm here to talk with you today during one of our Lunch in the Garden webinars. And I've got my first slide up there, my little promo slide. We've been doing our Lunch in the Garden webinars since I think sometime in April. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. We've kind of did a lot of them in the spring and into the summer. And then we've taken a little bit of a breather. Um, this is one of our, I guess our first one back uh, for the fall time. We're going to be doing another one next week on Papscani Island, which is a nature reserve down in the southern part of Rensselaer County. And we're also going to be doing uh, one on bulbs later in the season. And we've got a couple other ones scheduled for October. So uh, look for those. You'll be getting the emails. Um, if you're on this one today, I'm sure you'll be on the list to get the emails. So um, if you have any questions, you can send me an email at that address on the screen there. It's dhc3 at cornell.edu. And um, hopefully we'll get a lot of people um, involved in these webinars going into the latter part of the pandemic year of 2020. Okay. So um, just again, if you're joining us now, um, my name is David Shinnery, and we're going to be talking about some lawn care issues. I'm going to minimize my little picture here so I'm not uh, in the recording here so much. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. And um, if you have any questions as we go through today, I'm not going to be able to monitor the chat box and my colleague Marcy isn't here today. So I'm doing this one solo. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and at the end we'll go through the chat box and I'll try to answer your questions. Okay. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about lawn. So Fall is for lawn care, and we're going to talk a lot about overseeding today. So I first start off this program here talking about how 2020 was a tough year for lawns. I think 2020 was a tough year for gardening, and 2020 was probably a tough year for gardeners as well um, in a lot of ways. We had some challenging weather. We had some challenging conditions. And this is a little patch of my lawn. You can see it's got a lot of bare spots. It's got some good grass in there. It's also got some crabgrass and some weeds. So why did lawns fare so poorly over the summer? Well, I think cool season grasses really like to grow best in the spring and the fall, and they really decline in the summertime. Now, what do I mean by cool season grasses? Those are the grasses that we grow for the most part in this part of the world. The blue grasses, the fescues, and the rye grasses. Um, they really like to grow in the spring and the fall, and in the summertime, when we have very high temperatures, the root systems of those grasses naturally sort of die away and they become weaker just because they don't like that hot weather. And then add on the dry weather that we had um, really did those guys in. A lot of those grasses went dormant and they were not growing very well at all. So uh, we had periods where we had too much rain, a couple of uh, Parts of the season, I think earlier on, we had a really rainy period. Um, and then we've had some real deluges. And we've also had a long period in the middle of the summer where we just had too little rain. And we were actually in stage two drought, according to the US Drought Monitor, uh, which is the official arbiter of drought. So I think we're actually still in stage one drought um, in parts of Rensselaer County and parts of the Capital District. Um, a lot of lawns have poor fertility and they have low nutrients. And this picture of my poor lawn is really a picture also of a lawn that hasn't been fertilized. It's a good quality soil, but it's very low in nitrogen um, and I haven't really added anything to it. So I shouldn't really expect my lawn to look very good. And also there's plenty of insects, diseases, and weeds around. And we're going to be talking about weeds, especially crabgrass today. And at the end, I'll do a little wrap up and talk a little bit about insects. So what would we like? Well, we would like, you know, the castle on the green hill here to have a better lawn with fewer weeds without using chemical herbicides. You know, that's maybe not entirely possible, but we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about that idea today. And we're also gonna talk about having a thick, dense lawn year round, uh, cut, keeping the grass, uh, the, or the ground covered with grass and having no soil exposure. Now, the trouble with lawns that are thin is that they do allow erosion to occur and nutrients to run away, and we don't want that. We want a thick, dense lawn 
year round. So that gets to my idea of repetitive overseeding. And some of you know I've talked a lot about this and I'm gonna talk more about it today because this is the time of the year, this late summer and early fall and into October, when we can really use this idea of repetitive overseeding to our advantage. So what is it? Well, repetitive overseeding is spreading out grass seed over the existing area of grass more than one time a year. And this really was an idea that I didn't know a whole lot about until I read about and learned about the studies that were done by a guy named Dr. David Minner, who was at the Iowa State University. And his idea was to take these sports fields, like football fields, and as they were being used in the fall and beat up in the fall, to go out there and throw down grass seed and try to grow more grass, even as the athletes were playing on the fields. And the idea was to try to keep some cover of grass there for the athletes, because when they fell or when they uh, took a tumble, they would rather land on grass than hard packed so soil or mud. So the idea was to keep these uh, sports fields kind of greener than they had been by going out and putting down grass seeds several times during the, say, the football season. And that idea was brought back to Cornell by Dr. Frank Rossi, our great uh, extension specialist for turf grass, my wonderful friend at Cornell. Uh, he had plots of this repetitive overseeding that I saw during a field day. And I thought, gee, that's a really cool concept. Could we do that in Rensselaer County. So way back in 2003, I went over to the Averill Park High School and they let me use one of their sports fields. And this was a picture of what we were doing there. It was uh, the fall time and the students were back, the football players were back playing on this field and they beat this field to smithereens. But I was going out there every week and putting down uh, perennial ryegrass seed. And that was in those green strips you can see there. So I would go out when they weren't playing and throw down this grass seed in these green strips, they would come along and practice. And if we hadn't thrown down that grass seed, this whole area would be kind of that muddy brown look to it. But we had successfully grown this perennial ryegrass on the sports field. So I thought that was pretty cool. I actually could reproduce uh, the Iowa State study and I could reproduce the Cornell study uh, at Averill Park. So. The idea was, you know, if the kids could play on a better surface by putting down grass seed, why not do that? So I went away and that was the end of the study. But then I went back to have a look at it in the summer of 2004. And I saw this field that had regrown mostly with crabgrass, which had been there before, except for those uh, stripes of the perennial ryegrass, they persisted. And I realized something. I realized that the perennial ryegrass actually crowded out the crabgrass. That when you had so much perennial ryegrass there, or good grass, you actually could crowd out the weeds. Now, if you read a lot of gardening books and maybe a lot of websites, they talk about growing your plants very densely to crowd out the weeds. And we talk about that concept in lawns as well. And I actually could saw that happen here. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? that I actually could do something that I read about in a book and it actually worked. So the idea here was that the perennial ryegrass seedlings were crowding out the crabgrass seedlings. And this got me thinking, could this be useful for, useful for home lawns? Could you do this on your home lawn? Not necessarily your football field, but the average person, could they throw down this grass seed and crowd out the weeds? And then they might be able to use less herbicide. And that was really the thing that got me excited because we use a lot of pre-emergent herbicide to keep crabgrass out of lawns in New York State and really throughout the United States, it's a big deal. So the idea was, could we do this on home lawns? So that got me studying this uh, thing for the last really 15 years or so. And we have found, yes, that we can make applications of grass seed that will make lawns denser by filling in the bare spots and the, we, we we can do this enough and replace the annual weeds like crabgrass with desirable grasses. Now here's a picture of me looking really uh, good, I guess, in my shorts there <laughs> with my drop spreader putting down my grass seed. And I'm gonna show you a lot of pictures like that today, but it's really a very simple process and we can really get on the road to reducing the need for this pre-emergent herbicide. 
So just a little background to back up for one minute before we keep going here, because I like to talk about lawns. Um, we did mention that all the grasses that we grow in this part of the world are these cool season grasses, and they are Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, fine fescue, and tall fescue. So those are the really the big players here, and those are the ones you're going to find in your lawn, and that's, those are the ones you want to find in your lawn. So if we were doing this class together and I could see you, I would say, which grass species will work best in overseeding? And I wouldn't give you the answer here, but I would let you give some guesses. And I would say, well, we found that perennial ryegrass and tall fescue really are the two best grasses to use for overseeding. Now that doesn't mean that Kentucky bluegrass there, our really great Kentucky bluegrass, isn't a good grass. It's a wonderful grass. Um, it's a very dense grass. It's a beautiful grass. The trouble with it, with overseeding, is that it takes a long time to germinate. It takes at least three or four weeks to start to germinate under most conditions. So if we're going to be planting that Kentucky bluegrass, we're going to be waiting for it to germinate. Whereas the perennial ryegrass can germinate in seven days, maybe, and the tall fescue maybe in 10 days. So that's why I really like using the perennial ryegrass and the tall fescue for our overseeding because we get results faster. And when we're working sort of towards this end of the year, we only have so many weeks to put down grass seed. But I will say one little caveat here that it, something I've really learned fairly recently that you can make a really beautiful no mow lawn by repetitive overseeding. This is a picture of my front yard. This is the best grass I have in my whole property. And this area had been an ornamental grass garden. And I decided to take that ornamental grass garden out and put a lawn back in that spot because it was really getting too shady for the ornamental grasses. So I took, I dug out all the ornamental grasses, I raked it off. I really did, had a nice weed free area, a nice weed free soil to work with. And I started repetitive overseeding with beacon hard fescue. Now, beacon hard fescue is one of these very slow growing grasses. And in this picture, you can see I've only mowed this grass once in 2020. I mowed it at the beginning of the year to kind of get rid of some of the dead material over the winter. And that grass, that picture was taken about two weeks ago. That is all that, that has grown um, from the beginning of the year into August. So it's a really slow growing grass. It's a dark green grass that makes what I like to think of as a very attractive, almost shag carpet of grass. So if you want an area um, that you can not have a lot of foot traffic on and you want to not mow it, you might look into this beacon hard fescue. I'm kind of a little excited about that right at the moment. But let's talk about our crabgrass again. So why can we use this overseeding to get rid of crabgrass? Okay, well, I wanted to give you a little background on crabgrass, a little history here. Uh, crabgrass is not native to North America, but it's native to Europe and Eurasia, but it's been distributed worldwide. And it was brought to the USA in 1849 by the US Patent Office as a potential crop for livestock to graze upon. So they brought this grass seed here of this crabgrass, <laughs> and they gave it away, they put it all over the place, they encouraged plant farmers to plant it, and now we have another weed. So not the first time that our government has introduced a plant that we really wish they had not introduced, because now crabgrass, of course, is found everywhere. So crabgrass um, is really this interesting plant because it has a very short life cycle, but it really dominates our lawns in this part of the world. So Crabgrass, uh, as far as the life cycle goes, of course, is an annual. It's going to not be around in the early spring when the snow melts. So we don't have crabgrass initially in March, but it's going to germinate shortly thereafter. And technically, we have two species of crabgrass in this part of the world, the hairy or the large crabgrass and the smooth or the small crabgrass. Now, it doesn't really matter too much which one's in your lawn or which one you're dealing with because the life cycles are very similar. So that is not really that important of a point. So the spring comes along, the snow starts to melt if we have snow, and the crabgrass starts to germinate when the soil temperatures reach about 55 degrees 
for four or five consecutive days. Now, when is that? Well, it might be mid to late April. We're taking a guess there. Depends on how crazy of a season we're having. It could be earlier, it could be later. But about the time the forsythia is starting to bloom and starting to come around, we start to see the crabgrass germinate. But of course, it doesn't all germinate then. Crabgrass has a very long season of germination. You might get some seedlings germinating that early, but you can have crabgrass germinate in May, June, July, well into the season, crabgrass can come along. So we start to look for it uh, early in the season and we put on our pre-emergent herbicide early in the season, but crabgrass can come along much later than that. And really what people have been uh, used to doing, I guess you could say, is that they go out and they get this pre-emergent herbicide. It's usually a granular product, but you can get it as a liquid as well. Uh, sometimes it's called a crabgrass preventer. And we often say you should be thinking about putting that on at Forsythia, that wonderful yellow flowered shrub, when that's in the full bloom or just going out of full bloom in the spring. You put this granular down and this prevents weeds from germinating. It, perform, it makes a chemical barrier that keeps the plants or keeps the weeds from germinating. So thousands of acres are treated with this in New York State every year. And how long does it last? Well, that barrier of the chemical lasts anywhere from about six to 16 weeks. And if you have a very high maintenance, high end sort of lawn, maybe you have a lawn care service, some of those lawn care services actually put on two applications of pre-emergent herbicide because they're worried about crabgrass coming along later. So they might be putting it on early and then they might be putting it on another six or eight weeks later. So they're actually getting two doses of pre-emergent and uh, it's quite a bit of material. So I started taking pictures of crabgrass this spring because I thought hmm, maybe I can do a talk on this later in the season. So I didn't have a whole lot of crabgrass in the early spring in my lawn, I think because it was dry, but I did find some nice seedlings here in June, early June, 2020. You can see these are tiny crabgrass seedlings. They're germinating in bare patches in my lawn even though it's very dry, even at this point, they're coming along and you can see their tiny little light green seedlings there coming in and they're gonna fill in and take over. And this is an area of my lawn where I used to have a lot of nice tall fescue, but the deer came along and destroyed a lot of this with their hoof prints and their deer herd thundering through this area over the winter. This turned into mud and the crabgrass moved in. So the dark green grass in the picture is the tall fescue and the light green grass is crabgrass. And you can see it's not really big there yet, but it's starting to fill in and starting to dominate that. And if we were to go out and look at this time of the year, this late summer, early fall, we would see the crabgrass is really filled in quite extensively. And it tends to be this light green or this yellowy green color. So it's very easy to identify. And here's a picture of a lawn that's almost entirely crabgrass. So this is a lawn that really doesn't have a lot of good, desirable, cool season grass in it. And it also doesn't have a whole lot of weeds, which is kind of interesting, other than crabgrass. Uh, if we see crabgrass in other places, we get a different kind of grass growing there. Look at that picture of crabgrass in a mulch bed. It's very open, it's crabbing or spreading along the ground, and it has that very distinctive sort of uh, finger-like seed head. And that's a really great ID characteristic as well as the color and just the overall growth pattern. So crabgrass can be in landscape beds uh, quite extensively as well. Crabgrass can go grow taller, it can grow flat, and it produces many of these tillers or these branches, some of which will root and grow into the ground. So one crabgrass plant can make up to 150,000 seeds and crabgrass plants can make seed even if they're mowed down at a half inch tall. So we can mow very low and we actually have crabgrass making seed and we actually encourage crabgrass by mowing too low. But then the story keeps going and the crabgrass dies with the first frost. This is a picture I took down um, in Kinderhook on a sports field that has turned brown. Now a few days before this, it was probably green crabgrass, but with that first frost or the waning days of summer, sometimes it's just enough to have some cool weather and the crabgrass turns brown. So then this dies and we have bare spots for the winter time. 
So if we start overseeding in the fall or the late summer of the fall, we can take advantage of when this crabgrass starts to die because our new grass seed will start to germinate and fill in. So we're really capitalizing on the life cycle of the crabgrass. So here's a case study that kind of shows what I mean about this overseeding. Uh, here we are at Lansingburg's 911 Memorial Park. We have our master gardeners that do a fabulous job there um, with the gardens there and the roses and the, the landscaping. And this was a picture I took in spring 2017. And you can see there's some clover there, that's the green stuff. But most of this had turned into just a barren crabgrass sort of wasteland. And if we went back in time, we would realize that this lawn had actually been sod back in 2011, but it had been let go. Uh, there had been a lot of white grubs in here that eat the roots of the grass plants. And the crabgrass had kind of taken over and you've got, instead of this uh, sod cover, you had this crabgrass kind of ecosystem with grubs in it. Uh, very, you know, poor conditions. The mowing had been too low. There had been no fertilizer applied. There had been droughty conditions. So it really devolved into just uh, bare soil practically. So at 9-11 Park, we did a little study and we decided we would plant perennial ryegrass at three pounds per thousand square feet or tall fescue at four pounds per thousand square feet. Those are our two rates. We're gonna either mow it before we plant the grass seed the first time, or we're not gonna mow it. And then we're gonna either put starter fertilizer down or no starter fertilizer. So this was a little experiment I did back in 2017. I had these different plots of the two different types of grass, the ryegrass and the fescue. I either mowed it before I put the grass seed down or I didn't. And some plots I put starter fertilizer on and some part, plots I didn't. So there's just a picture of my mower. So the plan was to go out um, during this late summertime, starting in mid-August and going into October and put down grass seed four times on each of these plots at two to three week intervals and continue this um, into October. And this is the, basically the recipe for overseeding, using the grass seed maybe four times, five times, starting in mid-August. I know it's uh, you know, into September now, but we still have time you can start to do this and we go into October and we do it maybe every other week or every 10 days or almost whenever our schedule permits we can do this. So I've always used a simple drop spreader. I don't use an aerating machine. I don't do slit seeding. I don't rake it. Uh, people send me lots of questions this time of year where they say, oh, should I aerate it? Should I slit seed it? Should I rake it? Don't do any of those things unless you really have a very heavy or very clayey soil. You probably don't need to do any kind of aeration. And raking is probably not very uh, useful either. But if you have one of these drop spreaders, that's a really good tool to use because you're gonna put your seed in there, you're gonna set it to put down three to four pounds per thousand square feet uh, at the proper rate, and you're just gonna roll it over and put down your grass seed. So what happened back in 2017? Well, we had very dry weather. And I won't go through these numbers here, but we had very little rainfall that fall. And as you know, grass seed needs uh, you know, moisture to germinate. So I was not getting a lot of grass seed to grow. So I overseeded these plots actually six times, which is a lot, but I really wanted to be able to catch any kind of moisture that came along. Um, and I really wanted to see if I could get some results here. And what you eventually start to see is really interesting in this picture. The wide bladed grass is the crab grass and the narrow bladed grass where the blue arrow, arrow is pointing is the perennial rye grass that's coming in. So the perennial rye grass is starting to grow in amongst the crab grass. As the crab grass is kind of losing its steam and kind of going pooping out, the uh, perennial rye grass is starting to grow in between. And you'll start to see that. And this was really the proof of the pudding picture. By the third week of October, we had these green strips. And those were made by that drop spreader, just dropping that grass seed straight down. And on the left, you can see we had perennial ryegrass. On the right, we had tall fescue. And all around it, we had had some frost or some dry, cold conditions. The crabgrass was dead. So here we have transitioned this area into, from crabgrass into the ryegrass or the tall fescue. So on the left here, you can see the tall fescue. On the right, 
is a plot where we didn't put any grass seed and we had about 85% new little seedlings there of tall fescue. And on this one, the left is the crabgrass that's dead and the right is the perennial ryegrass. And we had about a 95% cover there. So this was kind of the way to do it. And this worked really well that fall. We had just enough moisture, I think, to get this kind of green V-shaped strip around the memorial there. And you can see the dead crabgrass on the edges. So if you use repetitive overseeding and it works well, you can get something like that to happen. Now it doesn't always work <laughs> that well. I won't be enough of a salesman to tell you it's always gonna work that well. You as gardeners know, there's a lot of variables out there um, and not everything always works as well as we would like it. But, but that was a good, uh, good, good situation there that I had. Just very briefly, I'm gonna say in 2018, we asked the question, what if we aerated? Because aeration is one of these things that people like to do to their lawns. Um, I'll just say very briefly, we did a little study in my backyard with perennial ryegrass. We aerated or didn't aerate, and we overseeded again um, in sort of mid-August into October. Uh, we used a big aerator like this machine, the little blue arrow there is showing you the tines. This is a machine that basically pokes holes in the ground. And the idea is that you're gonna let more oxygen, you're gonna let more moisture, you're gonna let um, more maybe fertilizer, if you put fertilizer down to go into the soil, maybe this will be a good thing. Well, I found out that this aerator, when you have a lot of wet weather, does a bad job. Because in 2018, that fall was wet, warm, and humid. And I won't look at, get, read through these numbers, but we had a lot of rain. It rained a lot in autumn 2018, and it turned things into mud. So this picture shows on the left, a plot I seeded and aerated four times. On the right is a plot I just seeded four times. And you can see there's a lot more grass on the right hand side where I didn't aerate than if I aerated on the left. So don't aerate if it's wet out. <laughs> That's a basic um, conclusion there, I guess. And you can see again, uh, on the left, I had just an air, uh, overseeded plot. I had a fairly good amount of grass there. We got about 90, 85, 90% cover. So um, if you've got the right conditions, just throwing the grass seed down will be fine uh, because the aeration is disruptive. The wet weather is gonna be uh, too, too much for the aerator and you're gonna just turn it into mud. And in that case, with the wet weather, we really only need to seed maybe three or four times because we had so much uh, wet weather for the germination, it was good. Okay, uh, just a couple more examples here really briefly. 2019, uh, my friend Gail has a lovely home, but her lawn is quite lousy. Um, and here's a patch by her pool, mostly crabgrass. So we started to overseed and we used tall fescue here. Um, and then we, I think we overseeded that four times. And here's the frost. This was actually a frosty morning in November. I stopped by and took a picture of Gail's lawn, and there's our strip of tall fescue with the dead crabgrass all around. So that one turned out really nicely in November 2019, and there's a picture of the tall fescue on the left, the crabgrass on the right, where it's not overseeded. Here's another picture of Gail's backyard. This soil in this area is absolutely terrible. It's a sandy soil. It has no nutrients in it. It's got a lot of rocks in it. Maybe uh, this is an Averill Park. For those of you that live in Averill Park, I know you've got some tough soils out there. But you can see this is mostly bare spots and crabgrass. And there's on that early November morning, we have this beautiful strip of tall fescue we grew. So that's uh, kind of how well it worked um, in November 2019. So just a summary here. How to use perennial ryegrass or tall fescue. Okay. Now I will give a caveat to you out there in TV land. Uh, do not use something called Kentucky 31 tall fescue seed. You will find this being sold widely in local stores. Now, why do I say don't use Kentucky 31? It's a very old variety. It's light green. It's kind of weak. It's not dense. It's not a very attractive grass. Uh, it's the original kind of tall fescue. 
Um, just a moment on tall fescue, it, it's a weed, basically. It's a weedy grass. The turf grass breeders back in the 1930s and I think 1940s actually took this weedy grass and developed this one called Kentucky 31. So at the time, it was a breakthrough. It was a wonderful thing because they used it for pastures. But since then, they've made it so much better that the Kentucky 31 is not a good grass for lawns. So don't plant it on your lawn. If you have a utility area, someplace you just want to put something down to hold the soil, you might use it. But it's not good for a lawn because it's very inferior. It's light green. It's not dense. The new tall fescues are so much more beautiful uh, than the Kentucky 31. It's sort of like, you know, if you had a choice of a car, would you rather have like a 2000, you know, I don't know, Honda or Toyota or Lexus or something like that? Or would you really want to be driving around in a 1958 Ford Etzel? You know, it's not safe, it's big, it's clunky. That's my comparison. So Kentucky 31, don't buy it. We can start seeding in late August and go into early October. So we are into the second week of September. I think we still have plenty of time to go out and do some repetitive overseeding. And really, we might be able to go into mid-October. We have had many uh, autumns in the past few years where we have warm weather well into October. And you can keep seeding once the, if the weather uh, continues to be fairly warm. I like to use a rate of about three pounds per thousand square feet. You might use four pounds if you're using tall fescue. And I'm going to put down seed three, four, or five times, hopefully not six times. But if we get some rain, we have that nice warm weather, you can probably count on maybe using three or four times of seed and getting some good results. I kind of skipped over the starter fertilizer issue. I would say definitely starter fertilizer is a good thing to use. Um, I'll show you a picture of what that looks like in a minute. Um, but you don't really know the fertility of your soil. And if you have a soil that's um, not been fertilized in a long time or maybe sort of a sandy soil, especially like at Gale's house, I think the starter fertilizer would definitely help those little grass seedlings get going. And you really want to mow at an appropriate height. You can just mow um, when you're overseeding. Some people say, oh, do I have to stop mowing? No, keep mowing, keep mowing the normal way. Um, but mow high. I like to say mow at about three inches. Don't have your mower set very low. And again, don't really aerate unless you have a reason to do that. Okay, so here's my graphic. We're going to think about using more grass seed rather than, and this is kind of rude here, rather than our crabgrass adventure. Now, certainly there's, there's place for that material and there's times to use it. But think about if you want to have a more ecologically friendly lawn, we can do some of that using more grass seed. Okay, uh, a couple of things that... Uh, our caveats here. Repetitive overseeding will not necessarily reduce perennial weeds. So this is not a miracle. <laughs> if we could go out and throw down grass seed and get rid of ground ivy or get rid of broadleaf plantain, that would be, I think, a miracle. And this is not something that's going to really do that. Your perennial weeds will probably still be there. Um, you might have less bare spots and you're going to have less crabgrass, but you're probably still gonna have your round ivy. And here's my picture of the starter fertilizer. Um, that's an older bag of it. You might see a little bit different label on the current stuff out there, but I think that's a good idea. And I would put it, that out maybe at the time I put down my first application of seed. And certainly water is important. I've always relied on just mother nature giving me water um, with these little research studies. If you have irrigation and you can water, ideally you would give the uh, area about one inch. You don't want to water every day though because watering every day will keep the area too wet and your seed will probably rot. Okay, so that's my overseeding spiel and I just want to take a few more minutes here and talk about some ways to help your lawn recover and grow in the autumn other than overseeding. Uh, just a few more ideas here and um, certainly if you have questions again type them in the chat and I can talk about that um, when we finish up. Okay, so um, I just want to make a note here first off in this section, um, asking you a question, are you clip collecting your clippings? Uh, collect collecting your grass clippings, it's hard to almost say that. Um, I was at a friend's house 
and they had a giant pile of grass clippings and they live out in the country. They have a lawn service. Um, and I said, do they actually collect the clippings? And they said, yeah, they do. Uh, not always, but they, they collect the clippings. And I thought, why are you collecting the clippings? Um, you know, I thought we kind of talked about that 20 years ago, but I just want to talk about it again today. There was a lot of research back in the 1980s and 1990s, and it looked into why people collected these clippings. And if you had a lot of clumpy clippings, if you didn't mow um, enough, you got a lot of clumpy clippings and clippings sitting on the lawn, and that was kind of unsightly. But nowadays we have these mulching mowers, and this is a picture of my little Honda mower. I don't get any endorsement from Honda for saying this, but it's a really nice little mulching mower. It chops the clippings really finely. I don't have to collect the clippings usually, and I don't want to collect the clippings because the clippings filter down in the lawn. They add the nutrients from the clippings back into the lawn. It's the equivalent of a once, uh, one fertilizer application a year. So leave the clippings if, if you can. I mean, if you can't for some reason and you have to collect them, so be it. But it's not really a great environmental practice to collect the clippings, pile them up, or put them in a landfill or send them off to the dump or wherever they go. So I really am a very big proponent of trying to leave the clippings on the lawn because they do add fertility back to the lawn. Think about harvesting all those clippings off. You're really just taking away the nitrogen and the nutrients. So leave them there if at all possible. And uh, one of my other mantras, and maybe some of you have heard this before, is that uh, you got to mow at the right height. Mowing is such a simple thing. Um, we have so many people that mow, and it's just kind of as common as, you know, I don't know, sweeping your kitchen floor. But it really is an important practice. And uh, checking your mowing height is a good thing to do this time of the year. Because, as this little chart shows, the higher that we mow, the less crabgrass we have by the end of the season. Now, I've often said that I'm an Ohio State alumni, so I'm not a big fan of Michigan State, but they did one good thing. They did the study here, and they mowed crab, uh, turf plots at one inch all summer. And by the end of the summer in September, they had 96% crabgrass, whereas if they mowed at a height of four inches, they only had 4% crabgrass. So mowing higher will reduce the amount of crabgrass that you have, and maybe some of the other weeds as well. And here's my really old graphic showing that as we mow higher, we have a bigger root system on our plant. So really mowing higher benefits the plant, uh, the grass plant itself, because that has a bigger root system. And with the drought this summer, a bigger root system was a good thing to have. So I actually went out the other day and I said, David, what height are you really mowing at? And I wanted to see. So this is my little Honda mower. I measured it. I just took a tape measure here, stuck it down in the lawn, and I took this with one, you know, two hands here. I'm trying to do this thing, so it's not the best picture in the world. But you can see I'm mowing about three and a half inches tall. I'm mowing pretty high here. Um, I might notch that down one more notch. Uh, maybe three is a little bit more what I want to be doing. But this is just an easy way to check how high am I mowing? What am I really doing here? And on a John Deere lawnmower, I have a uh, riding mower, <clears throat> it's really luxurious because all you have to do is turn this dial and it dials in your mowing height. Well, I wanted to see, is this really accurate? And yes, uh, there I have it set to 3.5 and John Deere, man, you're right on there because I measured it on my nice garage floor there and I'm mowing at 3.5. So I would mow at that height probably most of the season. Uh, I could mow a little bit lower, three is probably acceptable. Uh, some people like to mow uh, low in the fall, uh, the last mowing. Um, you know, if you want to do that, that's probably okay. But it also, if you mow it really low, it actually helps the grass to dehydrate a little bit in the wintertime. So I, I don't really see too much of a reason to mow too low in the fall. Uh, let's talk about fertilizer a little bit. Um, you know, I'm a pretty laid back person. But if I was going to fertilize my lawn one time a year, it would be in September. And we certainly have time still to do that. Um, whether you're going to fertilize it once a year, twice a year, three times a year, that's the low, medium, high in this graphic here. September is really a great time to fertilize your lawn. Why? 
because the lawns are recovering. They're putting on some growth. They're regrowing the root system. They could really use that fertilizer now. So if you're going to do it, uh, you're going to do it this time of the year. That's the best time to do it. Okay, how much do I apply? Well, that's a good question. Um, the general recommendation is to put down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. Now, there's a couple ways to figure that out. I have this bag of fertilizer, and it's got a list of spreaders there. You can see them on that chart, and it's got Spiker, Lesco, Prizlon, Earthway, Cyclone, Scotts, Bailey, Bigfoot. It doesn't have my spreader, so I have to do a little math, but if you have the right spreader and you get the right fertilizer, you can just look on the chart and say, how much do I want to put down? Well, on the chart there, it says pounds per thousand square feet. So if I put on five pounds per thousand square feet and the fertilizer is 10% nitrogen, I'm going to be putting on a half pound of nitrogen. So really, I want to put on 10 pounds per thousand square feet if the fertilizer is 10% nitrogen to get my one pound. So you have to think about it a little bit, but it kind of all makes sense. Um, if my fertilizer is 10% nitrogen, and really look at your label because you'll get a lot of information out of that. Or as I say in my, my uh, print there, you can do some math on the back of a used envelope. I get my mail and I do my math on the back of a used envelope and figure out what I should be doing. Uh, fall is a good time to do soil testing for gardens or for lawns. If you have a new lawn or a lawn that's not really doing well, we can send off a soil sample. The lab that we use over at the University of Massachusetts was shut down for a period of time, but they're functioning now, and we can get a nice reading on your nutrition level. If you ever happen to have a problem, this is especially important. Or if you're starting maybe a new garden, I'd like to do a soil test. How about mulching leaves? We're going to be seeing some leaves falling soon, and mulching leaves, again, was studied quite a bit actually by Michigan our friends at Michigan State, I believe it was, and they figured out that you can mulch leaves into your lawn and it's perfectly fine. It doesn't harm the lawn at all. It gives the lawn a little bit more of a nutrient level uh, boost. As long as the leaves are dry and you're not doing a tremendous amount that you've got great vast clumps out there, the leaves are gonna dry up and it's really a benefit to not put them in the landfill or rake them to the curb and have them carted away. We're saving energy and maybe being a little kinder to the environment. Uh, the last picture over there on the left is my ginkgo tree leaves. And the ginkgo tree has very tough, very kind of juicy, fibrous leaves that don't mulch well. But oak leaves and maple leaves and most of the common trees are going to be just fine. So chop them up fine and leave them on the lawn if you can. Now let's talk a minute about these weeds. Our two most popular broadleaf weeds, I think, are ground ivy and broadleaf plantain, shown there. And if you are going to use an herbicide, late September into October is the best time to do it. So again, you know, I'm not a big proponent on using herbicides, but if you're going to do it, do it right. I think that's the, the take-home message. The spring, a lot of people put on herbicide on these weeds, and they might die, they might not die because it's the wrong time of the year. The best time of the year to do this is uh, this time of the year, late September into October, because what's the plant doing? It's going to sleep, it's going um, dormant for the winter. So if I put the herbicide on it right before it goes dormant, it's gonna take that material down into the root system and kill it more effectively than any other time of the year, okay? So there are selective herbicides. Uh, often these have 2,4-D, MCPP dicamba. Uh, they're used to uh, spray on these broadleaf weeds. They're very common in stores and they're used a lot in lawn care. They come in liquid or granular formulations. And the picture of the spruce tree there is to say don't use this stuff when it's 85 or 90 degrees out because it can make a cloud of vapor and kill adjacent plants. This time of the year it's cool enough, no worries there. So don't worry about that. How does it work? This is how it works in the spring, kind of slow. These were pictures I took for our weed seminar back in uh, June, and I sprayed a plot uh, on the left-hand side there. You can see there's a lot of ground ivy and plantain, and I came back a week later. I sprayed it with this broadleaf herbicide, and the weeds are twisting. They're kind of curling, and they're turning purple. So 
if you spray this stuff out there, this is what you're going to see <clears throat> on something like broadleaf plantain or, um, or ground ivy. You're going to see twisting, you're going to see slowing of growth, yellowing, and eventually it's going to die. Okay. Um, if you can find a formulation that has something called triclopyr in it, that will actually be the best one for ground ivy because ground ivy tends to be kind of tough to kill. All right. So uh, there's a picture of my lawn. I can really use a little of this herbicide there. You can see um, it's kind of a weed fest there. But the question would be, again, what is the best time we went over that? This stuff doesn't kill the grass. No, the grass will be fine. The grass isn't harmed by this herbicide at all. Is it safe to use? Well, it's approved by the government. Uh, I will say it can be somewhat of a concern if we have a lot of rain after you use it. I would say if you use it, I would stay off of the area for maybe a few days or a week just to not be, uh, to be the most careful, but it basically is rather uh, safe to use. So keep your kids and pets off for a few days or a week. That's not going to even say that on the label uh, because they're not required to. Um, and if I kill off a lot of the weeds, will I have a lot of bare areas? Yes, that is the problem here. So if I killed my weeds, I would have bare areas. Um, I could overseed it, but I would have to wait a couple weeks after I use the 2,4-D. So really, it's probably better to try to clear the weeds out earlier uh, in the season or kind of do it one year and then overseed the next year. It's a little tricky to do those two things together. Okay. Uh, there is an alternative, which I'll mention very briefly, called Fiesta. That's the iron herbicide, which I've talked a lot about in the past. Um, it's on our website, so I won't go into it too much. It will kill the broadleaf weeds, not quite as effectively as the 2,4-D, um, but it's a little more environmentally benign, I would say. So that's a uh, product you can look for. It's probably not sold in local stores. The one brand name is called Fiesta. It tends to be fairly expensive. Um, here's some plots that I did a number of years ago in June. On the left-hand side, you can see there's ground ivy and some plantain there. And then on the right, after we sprayed it twice, we got rid of most of the weeds, but not all of the weeds. So it's an alternative herbicide. Um, it's not quite as easy to use um, and not quite as effective. Okay, and that's what it looks like uh, when we spray it once. The plantain tends to turn sort of black when you spray it with the iron herbicide. Okay, and I wanted to get to the end here before we spent too much time here. Uh, I just want to make a note, if you ever have had grubs in your lawn, um, I think it's going to be a big grub year. <laughs> I've done a little grub checking in my own lawn, and I have found quite a few grubs. So grubs, of course, are these larvae of beetles, Japanese beetle, European chafer beetle, oriental beetle. This is what they look like when they're the grubs. They're under the ground. They're eating the roots off of the grass plants. They're C-shaped. They have six brown legs and a brown head capsule, and they're kind of white, milky in color. Now, this is my really old graphic here of the grub life cycle. If we look very carefully there and see September, we have grubs getting very large and grubs eating the roots, and that's what they're doing right now. So how do you check to see if you have grubs in your lawn? Well, I went out to my lawn last week. I took a shovel, and I just cut a one foot by one foot uh, section on three sides, sort of like cutting a brownie out of a pan. Um, I'm hungry for lunch, you can tell. And I flipped that sod over and I saw uh, what I saw on the picture on the right there, a lot of soil. My root systems weren't really very good because the root systems have declined over the summertime. So I started to pick through that soil and here I found a grub. And I picked through more soil and I found more grubs. And I found 13 Japanese beetles in that one square foot. And that is enough to do quite a bit of damage. If you find more than say five European chafer beetles or more than eight uh, Japanese beetles, and it's hard to know what they are, but if you see more than let's say five grubs per square foot, you're probably gonna start to see your lawn be affected by that. So I found 13 grubs in that one area, and this is what they look like. They're all feeding on the root system, so my grass is not going to be too happy about that. So here I have a movie of the grubs, and I thought I would leave you with this thought here. 
because it's lunchtime and I want you to see these grubs moving around. <laughs> so we have uh, what we call second instar Japanese beetle. There's a lot of them out there now. The bad news is, what are we going to do about that? Hmm. Well, if we aerated the lawn, we might kill some with our aerator machine, but I don't happen to own an aerator machine. I'm going to probably just hope for the best. I'm probably not going to do too much about it because my lawn doesn't get a lot of attention. But if I had a very high maintenance lawn or I had a nice lawn, I probably would have to use one of the fast acting insecticides to try to kill those grubs at this point, because that is a population that's going to be a problem. Now, what will happen is a lot of people won't do the monitoring like I did, and they won't check this this time of the year. Those grubs will feed from now into the, probably December when the soil gets very cold, and in the spring, the lawn is going to be dead. And then I'm going to get the phone call, why did my lawn die? So this is just serving as a warning here. I think the conditions have been good for grubs to be very active, uh, and very um, prolific this season. So we had some good egg laying weather by the mother for the mother beetles. And uh, if you have concerns about grubs, go out and look for them now. Okay, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I certainly appreciate everybody tuning in today. It was a lot of information in a short time. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.